Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci Online. And a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. An edited recording of this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel. I'll post up a link to that uh, in the chat where you'll find recordings of all our online talks. It would help us reach a wider audience if you could subscribe to our channel as well. You'll also find the links on our website, wincafesci.org.uk. If you enjoy tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for it there to be notified about future talks. After tonight's talk, we'll take a break for a few minutes before the Q&A, so please put your questions into the chat and either Steve or I will read them out. That includes our viewers on YouTube as uh, we can take the questions via chat from there as well. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through them all. So tonight's speaker has been an astronomer since childhood. He has taught astronomy to adults and children for more than 40 years and has authored many articles and several books on practical aspects of astronomy. He writes equipment reviews and a monthly binocular tour for the BBC Sky at Night magazine. He's the Dark Skies advisor to the Cranbourne Chase area of Natural Beauty International Dark Sky Reserve. Please welcome Steve Tonkin. Uh, thank you, William, and thanks for inviting me. Right. Right, you should have a screen up that says Fuzzy Blobs, a guide for the perplexed, which is effectively what we're going to be looking at this evening. Um, ever since people started looking at the sky way back in the depths of time, nobody really knows who the first sky watchers were. Um, apart from the stars, for which they had their own explanations for, um, anything from holes in the sky to deities, uh, planets, which were the things that moved against the background of the sky. So that's why that included the sun and the moon. That was the, because the word comes from the um, Greek for wanderers. There were also some sort of fuzzy patches. And even when the telescope was invented, a few of them resolved into stars. So you could say, okay, those were made of stars, but there were others that just weren't, and they remained in their fuzziness, as it were, and they, they were given the name nebulae, which is Latin for clouds. And in astronomy, the definition of a nebula is really anything that is sort of hazy, vague, indistinct, no serious outline to it. And what we now know is that many of these, and the ones which um, to some extent are the most important, are uh, gas and dust and things like that. And we divide them vaguely into um, about half a dozen different classes. So there's what's called emission nebulae. These are, this is gas and dust, which actually gives out its own light. There are reflection nebulae, which are things that reflect starlight. There are ones called planetary nebulae, and I'll deal with those separately. They look like they might be ghostly planets, which why they got that name. Um, supernova remnants, we'll, we'll talk about that later as well. Dark nebulae, which just what they sound like. And then a few classes of, of starry things. So things called open clusters and uh, globular clusters and what we now call galaxies, what used to be called spiral nebulae. So let's just kick off and have a look at this with this area in the sky here, which is called the Rho Ophiuchi um, complex. And you can see that there's a heck of a lot going on. You won't see this area of sky in the, in the sky tonight because uh, it's approximately where the sun is, or the sun is approximately where it is now. Would you believe the sun moves through the constellation of Ophiuchus? Astrologers, eat your hearts out. But we've got def we've clearly got different things going on. This is as near as we can get to, to natural light. So there's obviously dust and murky stuff around here. There's the red stuff, which doesn't seem to have a heck of a lot going on in it, but all the red stuff seems to have a, st a bright star in it somewhere. There's a good reason for that. There's the blue stuff, and there's the yellow stuff, and there are, of course, the stars, and 
more sort of dusty looking stuff around the place. So there's clearly a lot going on. If you're interested, this little star here is the one called Rho Ophiuchi. Um, if you look at it very carefully, you see it looks a bit like Mickey Mouse. It's actually a triple star, a bright one with two little ears sticking up out of it. And if you look at this patch here, this is actually not gaseous and nebulous. You'll see it's, it's actually made of stars. So you can just about resolve them. And that's one of the so-called clusters. In fact, there's other clusters in here, but we'll, we'll come to that sort of thing later. So let's take these in some sort of order because the, um, what we can do with these is we can start getting a handle on stellar life cycles, the life cycles of stars. And because it's a cycle, we can start wherever we like in it. So I will start where I choose to start, which is with an emission nebula with a bit of dust. So this is the emission nebula IC1396, sometimes well, it's part of what's called the elephant's trunk nebula. Sometimes you won't see that in this. There's only seeing a, a little bit of it. Um, it's about 2,000 light years away. For if you're not used to this stuff, it means it takes light 2,000 years to get here. Just a few things to point out what we're looking at. It. It's got these little dark patches in here. They're called Bok globules, and we'll mention those a bit later when we come more into the, the, the darkness stuff. And it looks very much as though there are voids in it here where it's black. And that is really, really misleading, which is something we shall, we shall see in a bit. But the, the overall impression of this is red. And there's a very good reason for this. As I'm sure most people know, most of the universe, most of the material in the universe is hydrogen. And because it's hydrogen, we get a lot of effects of hydrogen, which teach us about things. Now, I don't know how much how good your physics is, but this is effectively showing what, what are known as transitions in the hydrogen atom. Each of these, sometimes we think of them as electron subshells or something like that, but really think of them as energy levels. And um, to make an electron jump from the first shell outwards, we have to put energy into it. And if an electron falls back the other way, energy comes out of it. And the higher the energy, the more towards the blue end or beyond the blue end, blue-violet end of the spectrum, um, it's going to be the less energy that comes out of it, the more towards or beyond the red end of the spectrum it's going to be. So these Lyman lines here, they have lots of energy because they're going all the way down to the, um, the first energy level. And they're actually um, all in the, in the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. And the Passion, Bruckett and Funt and uh, our other series as well, they're all off of the infrared end of the spectrum. But the ones we're interested in are these ones here called the Balmer lines. And we just isolate those out for a moment. And each one of those, and they're called hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, hydrogen gamma, hydrogen delta. Each of these is associated with a very, very specific uh, wavelength of light. So hydrogen alpha, which is the one we're actually interested in at the moment, is the one that's uh, uh, just over six and a half thousand angstroms. And that's here in the spectrum. And if you're putting energy into this electron and it's going outwards, then that energy is going to be absorbed from whatever you're putting in and you will have a dark line there. It's called an absorption line. As it falls back, it emits that red line. And that red line is what the red in this nebula is. So what we're looking at is hydrogen emission. And the, the energy from that, for that comes from the stars within there. Let's go back the other way again. So let's take something we can see in the sky at the moment. This is uh, quite magnified. Uh, these here are the three stars of Orion's belt. And just below them, uh, almost slightly more than the distance um, below them as the distance across the whole span of the belt is something that clearly, and even with the naked eye, is clearly not a star. It's a fuzzy patch. 
And that's the thing we call the Orion Nebula, the Great Orion Nebula. It doesn't look particularly big there. If you happen to have an Anglo-Australian telescope, and your name is David Malan, you can get something like that. But that's old fashioned stuff that we did with film photography and filters. I would certainly see a lot more detail. But if you happen to have a Hubble Space Telescope, you can see a lot more detail. And this is what we get with the uh, HST. And again, even though this is false color, it's, it's, it's approximately what we would see with the naked eye if we could. We would never actually see these colors. There's not enough energy coming out of there for the human eye to perceive them, even if we were there. This is essentially a vacuum. Um, it's about 12 light years across, but there is, um, if we could not make something so rarefied as this in any of the laboratories on Earth. So it's, it's, it's better than a good laboratory vacuum, yet there's so much of it that we can see it. And again, we notice we've got the red, which we now know is the hydrogen alpha. We've got blue, which we'll come to later, which is reflection. And this whole lot around here is being energized by this little group of stars in here. And notice that the light around there is more of a yellow color. We don't have the blues, and we don't have the reds quite in there. And that is something we shall come to in a moment why. But if you look even deeper into this, which you can do with a Hubble Space Telescope, you find there's these little structures here. And if, as the HST can do, you can look even deeper at these, what you start to see is that what we have are regions of star formation. So if we take this one here, we've got a star that's forming here. There's a disk of material around it. We're looking at it edge on, which may eventually condense to form planets. Here up at the top, we're looking at one obliquely. So what we're looking at in one of these emission nebulae, big emission nebulae like this, we're looking at star forming regions. We're looking at the beginning of a stellar life cycle where gas and dust, this uh, molecular cloud it's sometimes called, collapses. As it collapses under gravity, it heats up. If it heats up enough, you'll get thermonuclear ignition and you have a star forming. Um, the more matter there is that forms that star, obviously the bigger the star is going to be, gravity is going to be greater and everything takes place a lot, lot, lot quicker. And the star will start off actually a lot, lot, lot bluer as well. Just up at the top of that, we can see we've got other stuff going on. This is the bit just above the uh, um, Orion Nebula, sometimes called the Running Man Nebula. And now we can clearly see around here, we've got this dust, some of that may collapse. And we've got these areas here, particularly close to stars, where we've got blue. That is reflection nebulae. And the reason it's they appear blue is to do with the way light is scattered. Even though the stars, well, they, they will be hot blue-white stars. But the reason the nebulosity looks blue is this. Um, it's mostly something called Rayleigh scattering. And this is what makes the sky blue. And let's come on to that in, in a bit later. So if you have things the size of oxygen molecules, for example, so we're, we're talking about things of atomic size, scattering light. As light's coming across this way, it, some of it backscatters, some of it scatters forward, and some of it scatters out to the side. But the important thing with this is that it's wavelength dependent. The closer you are to the blue-violet end of the spectrum, the more likely you are to have your light scattered. In fact, you, you, if you go down with the uh, ultraviolet, even more likely to have it scattered. And red light is more likely not to be scattered by this process of Rayleigh scattering. When you have bigger particles, you get what's called near scattering. And that is, you see, most of it's now going in the forward direction. And you get more, even more in the forward direction when it's larger particles. And this is not wavelength dependent. So we can see in this next thing here, what this is, what we get from here is our experience, say, of, an, of a nice blue sky. When we look close to where the sun is, the sky tends to look paler. When we look particularly about 90 degrees away from the sun, that's where the, star, the star can look, sky can look really deep blue. And the reason for that is 
when we're looking vaguely in the direction of the sun, which would be over here, what we're getting is a lot of me scattering, which is not wavelength dependent, so a lot of white light coming through here. Whereas when we look away from that, um, the me scattering is sending the white light off that way, very little coming back down. Whereas the Rayleigh scattering, which is a preferentially scattering the blue end, is what um, is going to come down to us more. So this is, what, this is why the sky is blue. Um, and it's important in what we can see in nebulae as well. So if we carry on and look around that Orion complex, where we have the flame and the horsehead nebula, I, they weren't shown in that original widescreen image. Uh, this is the left-hand star of Orion's belt here. And you need a much deeper exposure to show this. We've got emission nebulosity here. We've got a little bit of dust here. We've got reflection nebulosity obviously around there, but also reflection nebulosity here. And this is lit from behind and the lights coming through that. And this is why this is looking white. This is me scattering, this is Rayleigh scattering. So we, we see this stuff in the sky and, it's, and it tells us a little bit about what's going on. Now we start to get on to planetary nebulae. Um, planetary nebulae, come from the other end of a star's life cycle. And there's just a, a series of them coming up here. And they were named that by uh, William Herschel, who he looked at the first one on this list, which was the one you've just gone off the screen now, round one. And what you've got is something that looks a bit like a ghostly disc. And if you can imagine, you know, he didn't have photography, he was just using visual telescopes. So you could see these ghostly disks in the sky. They, and they looked like ghostly planets. So they were nebulae, they're diffuse, but they were um, they they were not they were they were nebulae, but they were also looking like planets look. So you've got this disk that looks like a planet, in one sense, but it's clearly not a planet because it's nebulous. So it got the name stuck, and these are what we get at the other end for stars' life cycle. So when a star like our sun has come to the end of its life. Um, what happens is the reactions in the core stop. Now, up until then, a star has been like a dynamic equilibrium of gravity pushing inwards, nuclear pressure pushing outwards, and keeps going. When the nuclear pressure stops, then the star collapses again. In this case, now it's formed quite a lot of helium. And nuclear processes start again as it collapses and warms up. But it starts, it, you get helium fusion right throughout the body of a star. We're talking about sun like stars now. And they expand enormously. As they expand, they cool. Um, as they cool, they redden. They go from white hot to red hot. They become what's called a red giant. And eventually, they will puff off their outer parts, which is what we can see in the upper one here, and leave a dying core behind a white dwarf. This um, is called the ring nebula for reasons that are fairly obvious. And you can see in that the, the star, the progenitor star, or what's left of it. These only last a few tens of thousands of years, which in astronomical terms is peanuts. Uh, most astronomical processes take a heck of a lot longer. There are some that take a heck of a lot shorter, but these take, uh, most astronomical processes take ages. And these last you know, a few tens of thousands of years, this white dwarf will eventually cool down and just sort of fizzle out. But what we've got, we're actually looking at this from one end on, as it were. If we were to look at it from the side, from over here, what we would see is something like this one down the bottom. This is sometimes called the Dumbbell Nebula. I prefer to call it the Apple Core Nebula because I think that's what it looks like. Um, in America, it's often known as the Diabolo Nebula. But, I mean, none of these names actually mean anything. It's just the way the astronomers talk to each other about it. And again, you've got the progenitor star in the middle, and you've got material pushing out in two different directions. But if you look carefully, it does actually form a complete disk around there. Now, this is probably the easiest one to see. It's in the constellation of Vulpecula, uh, again, getting tricky at the moment because it's getting quite low down in the west when it gets dark. But um, even in little binoculars, this look like a little rectangle in the sky. So you can see, and if we looked at one of these from the end, then we are getting, we, we, we'd see something like the ring nebula there. And 
this one here has just two different things. We've got the red. We know what the red is, and that red is hydrogen. And the green is clearly something else. And at the time that green was discovered, it didn't seem that if, when you looked at it with a spectrometer, it didn't have spectral lines that anyone had ever been produced on Earth with uh, glowing gases. So they gave it the name nebulium, that which is found in the nebula, because helium, you probably know, was actually first discovered in the spectrum of the sun and then discovered on Earth later. And so that was called nebulium. What we do now know is that it's, it's actually doubly ionized um, uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen three. An even bigger star, when it comes to the end of its life, undergoes what's called a core collapse supernova, and it completely destroys itself. And this is the remnants of a supernova that went off in 1054. Um, it was, I think we were, we were arguing about religion and books and dates and things um, in Europe at the time, but Chinese astronomers recorded that. Um, they called it a guest star. It was this very bright star, it arrived, um, you could see it in the day for a week or so. And then, like any good guest, it left, it faded out. And what had happened was this massive star had cataclysmically destroyed itself. And in doing so, it sent this debris around the place. And this debris is still expanding. This is a Hubble telescope, Hubble Space Telescope image, and it shows, and if you take these images 10 years apart, you can see the changes happening. So this is the supernova 1054 um, supernova remnant. It's also the one that uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell um, should, many of us think, got a Nobel Prize for. Nobel Prize for. She thinks she shouldn't because she'd never got anything else then when she was a research student at the time. Um, there's a, a thing called a pulsar, which is right in the middle of that, which is the remains of the, uh, of the original star. But we're not going into pulsars tonight. We're going to try and focus on nebulae. OK. So we've got stars being born in emission nebulae, lighting up. You get the reflection nebulae. So the reflection nebulae are associated with the life of stars. And then the planetary nebulae, which are associated with their deaths. So right at the end of that. And supernova remnants as well. Uh, this you can see at the moment. It's quite tricky in small binoculars, but um, can be seen. It's a, It's known as M1, Messier 1. The Messier objects are actually, they're almost all fuzzy blobs of one sort or another. Um, Charles Messier was trying to recover comet uh, Hawley. Uh, Edmund Hawley had predicted that the comet that bears, now bears his name would return. And he pred predicted when it was. And Messier was looking at things. He kept finding these fuzzy patches in the sky that weren't the comet. So he just made this catalog of things. Don't bother looking at these because they're not the comet. And they're actually mostly extremely interesting objects few bits and pieces that aren't. The other thing that's made in stars quite early on, um, it's young stars, well, stars, small stars make stuff you've heard of. So helium, oxygen, and carbon, which is where we'll go next. And there's quite a lot of carbon in the sky. And these here, I said I'd come to this, these things here look like they are um, voids in the stars. This one in particular, it looks like there's nothing there. And for a long time, people did think that. Uh, but it was a man called E. e. Barnard. And if you ever start studying these dark nebulae, um, you find a lot of them have Barnard designations. Um, they called him the man who never slept. And E. e. Barnard realized that what this was, what we're actually looking at, is not voids in the stars. We're looking at foreground dust. So even though that looks like we're going into it, it's, it's not like that at all. Uh, this is foreground dust obscuring the stars that are behind it. And this part of the sky, which you can see from the density of stars, we're actually in the Milky Way, um, going down to the southern Milky Way, which is where the, it's, it's most dense, is where we have most of these. And these are, it's, it's essentially mostly carbon. Um, there are others. There's other stuff in it as well that has been made, made in stars. So it's a, these are our dark nebulae. So we're sort of almost going back now to the beginning because these will ultimately collapse 
and ultimately we'll get the reflection nebula, uh, the emission nebulae forming, and again we'll have more star formation. So we're looking here now at things that have come from the end of stars, but then are going on to the beginning of stars. A star like our sun is almost certainly a third generation star. Everything that's in it has been through two stars already, it includes us, by the way, because everything we're made of is uh, made in stars. We're going to look at this one here for a bit. We'll look at it in a bit more detail. It's called Barnard 68. And it looks like there's just this void here. And this tells us a couple of things. One is, now that we know it's, it's dust, not uh, it's foreground dust, not a hole in the sky, um, it's, it's relatively close to us. And it is 500 light years is pretty small in uh, terms of the Milky Way. And notice the stars that you see in the dust mostly are reddened. If this was far away, we'd have white stars in front of it. These stars are reddened because of scattering. So remember the blue light is scattered um, preferentially. So the blue light will be going sideways almost as it were. And it's the red end of the spectrum that comes through. Which again is why um, sunsets and rises and moonsets and rises are reddened. It's exactly the same process going on. That's, that's Rayleigh scattering. If, however, you look at this as infrared, you get a completely different picture because the heat, the red end of the spectrum is able to come through. And we see now that we've got red stars, or reddish stars shining through this foreground dust. So this now, um, this is a huge globule probably, and this will eventually collapse and the whole process of star formation will start again. If you're interested in, um, dark nebulae. I think they're absolutely fascinating. They're mostly um, in the southern part of the Milky Way. Um, really, you need to go down to the southern hemisphere to see them, but there's uh, this is the star Altair here, and it has like a little couple of outrider stars. Just next to one of them, there's this little letter E in the sky. That is Barnard's E. Somebody seems to have some music going. A um, bit lower down south from there, there is this streak here known as Barnard's Black Lizard. Right, so let's look at what we've just been talking about. Start where we want. We have here a molecular cloud out of which stars can form as it collapses. So the star going through, so the sunlight star through its life, comes to the end of its life, forms a red giant. Ultimately, it blows off its outer, uh, outer atmosphere, becomes a planetary nebula and a white dwarf, which cools down and dies and a lot of the material eventually condenses again to form the molecular cloud out of which more stars could form. Or the other side of this, a much bigger star forms, you know, it's, it's bigger, so everything's, it's hotter, everything happens quicker, um, it's whiter. Again, forms a red giant, but it dies in a cataclysmic core collapse supernova and either forms a pulsar or a black hole quasar. Um, at the moment, again, we're not looking into those. So we are in these nebulae that we see. What we see is just about all the bits of, um, of star stellar evolutionary cycle that we can. Forgive me, I've got a brass band started up on the street outside me somewhere. It's most distracting. OK, I mentioned spiral nebulae. Um, these were really picked up by a man called Lord Ross. And what Ross did, he uh, had a huge telescope, a couple of meters diameter, and it was called the Parsonstown Leviathan. It was built between two huge stone walls at Burr Castle, Parsonstown in Southern Ireland, and said you had to be an accomplished mountaineer in order to be able to, to use this telescope on anything else. And he noticed that some of these fuzzy patches in the sky, <coughs> excuse me, once you looked at them in detail, um, had this spiral structure. So he called them spiral nebulae. 
And for a long time, right up into the beginning of the 20th century, there was a dispute of are these things actually part of the Milky Way Nebula or not? And obviously, once we get things like um, the Hubble Space Telescope, which can show us something beautiful like this, this is Bow Nebula, uh, Messier 81, we can see in here now, we're looking at this red. These are areas of star formation there. So we're actually seeing emission nebulae uh, in another galaxy. Now, we are tell you now it's 11.4 million light years away, but this wasn't always known. And it came, this came about the understanding of this um, due to a particular kind of star called a Cepheid variable. Now, variable stars are stars that vary in brightness. And Cepheids vary very, very regularly. And they have the same sort of pattern, quite a steep rise in brightness and a shallower drop off. Steep rise, shallower drop off. And they, it's, this happens over days. So it makes it quite easy to work with them and, and, and see what's going on. And the person who did most of this was this lady here. Um, she was a computer, which is what they called, it was mostly women, um, who did the calculations and the data processing long before the days of what we nowadays call computers. And she looked at Cepheid variables in the, the Magellanic clouds. These are like satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And the, the idea she had was this. Essentially, these are about the same, all about the same distance away from us, all the stars in there. It's like, you know, from where we are now, all the lights, say, in, um, I don't know, Brisbane in Australia are effectively the same distance away from us. You know, the, the, the difference, the actual difference is tiny compared to the, the overall distance. And she plotted the period of these Cepheid variables against their luminosity, their total output. And she found that there was a relationship between them. It was effectively a straight line. Now, what this enables you to do so it's, it's work out, OK, we, you don't even have to be able to, to know how bright something is. All you do is you count its period. So if you, say, have, have one that's got a period of 30 days up here, come across here, well, you've got something which is about 10,000 times as bright as the sun. So you can now use that as what's called a standard candle, and you can figure out how far away it is. So this now gave a key to finding out whether these spiral nebulae, these galaxies, were part of our um, Milky Way system or not. And it turned out they were enormous distances away. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. The nearest decent sized spiral galaxy is um, about two and a half million light years away. Now, to think about what that means, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about light coming from there before even Australopithecus. And that is purely because we can look at Cepheid variables, stars that have that characteristic light curve in something like the Andromeda galaxy or any other galaxy. And just by measuring their period, we know how bright they are. We know how bright they are. We know how bright they look. We know how far away it is. And that told us without doubt that the, the, the spiral nebulae were enormous distances away. Now, you never want to have just one standard candle because there could be something wrong with it. And actually, there is. There's actually two classes of uh, Cepheid variables. And it's not quite as precise as um, Henrietta swan um hoped. But you know, she, she certainly laid the groundwork for this. An enormous amount of uh, very good work in astronomy and somebody who ought to be far better known. What was also noticed was that the spectrum in these distance galaxies seemed to be red shifted. Now, if we take this top spectrum, now, which just means the light gets redder, but you can't tell just from looking at the light because without doing something to it, because you don't know what color it started off. But what we can do is look at characteristic lines in it. These are all absorption lines from various elements. So this are hydrogen alpha here, for example. And it's normally in this part of the spectrum. And they're all shifted to the red end. This is redshift. And it's equivalent to a Doppler effect. This is high frequency, 
red end as low frequency. As something's going away from us with sound, the sound gets lower. That's all. As, uh, racing cars go past or whatever. Okay. And they noticed that not only that, but the further away something is, the more the light is redshifted. So we can use redshift as a as a measure of of distance um, as well. So we, we can use that sort of like another standard candle. And then this man who you've all heard of, that's Edwin Hubble, um, worked on this and he realized that yeah, the not only did this happen, the further away a galaxy was, the faster it appeared to be going, sort of, the far, first, faster, for, for the faster away from us it appeared to be going. Some aren't. Um, things like the Andromeda galaxy are actually coming towards us. We've got about 4,000 million years and it's going to merge with us. But that's a, a completely different story. But in general, the further away, the further away they were, the faster they were receding. And what we'll brings something okay? So if that's the case, what it really implies actually is that the universe is expanding, although Hubble wasn't that good an observer. This man, uh, Milton Humerson, did some remarkable work. He worked with Hubble. Um, Hubble took all the credit for it mostly. Milton Humerson left school when he was 14. He was just interested in mountains. They, uh, and he volunteered to work up at Mount Wilton Observatory. And it turned out to be an astonishingly good observer, incredibly meticulous. And he added his data to Hubble's, and then you've got this. And this is Hubble's data down in the corner here. This is what Milton Humerson added within a couple of years. And you've got something now that looks completely different. It's much less varied and over the larger scale. Yes, it is pretty clear the further away things are, the faster they appear to be receding. We've got this whole idea now of an expanding universe just by looking at the light from these spiral nebulae, the, the galaxies. So we learn that from these as well. And then we come down to the other things of stars. It's clusters. Clusters are gravitationally uh, bound groups of stars. They can be a few dozen or a few hundred thousand. And there's two, essentially two types, globular clusters and open clusters. Let's just look at those. So this is a globular cluster. It looks like a globe. It is globular. They, they formed at the same time as the, uh, the, 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 the same time as the galaxy formed. So, but, um, so they tell us something about the, the age of the galaxy with the age of the stars in there, although there are a few little complications with that. Um, it's a little bit difficult at the moment because there's Certainly, some of them appear though they might actually be the cause of um, a CORES, the core, the core of very, very small satellite galaxies that have had their spiral arms cannibalized by the gravity of the Milky Way, in our case, or in the case of this one here. But they tell us something else as well. This is the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, very, very overexposed there. And this little dot here, M31, G1, globular one, sometimes known as mal 2 is a globular cluster. And we can see by looking at uh, M31 that it has got a halo of globular cluster clusters around it. And the Hubble Space Telescope can actually start resolving this. This is one in our own galaxy. This is M31G1 or MAL2. So, and it turns out that all spiral, all spiral galaxies tend to have a halo of globular clusters around them. Now, it would be sensible to assume that the brightest ones in any galaxy are as bright as the brightest ones in another galaxy. And by use by making that assumption, we've got yet another standard candle because we can be pretty sure how much how how bright the brightest globular clusters are going to be in any galaxy. And so this gives us another way of measuring the distance of the universe. Globulars are very, very useful for that. The other kind of clusters are called open clusters, and they're called that because they're much more open. So 
There's one here. He's called the Heart and Soul Nebula. This one, you see it's emission nebulosity. Um, it looks vaguely heart shaped, so it's called the Heart Nebula. The one next to it just called, well, Heart and Soul, isn't it? But you see, we've got a cluster of stars in here. We've got clusters of stars around here, and they're not that tightly bound. And there's maybe only a few dozen of them that we can see. Um, much more common one, an easy one to see, which you can see in the sky tonight. This is the Pleiades cluster, the Seven Sisters. Um, you won't see it like that. This is a long exposure, but uh, even in binoculars, and don't you try and use a telescope on it, it won't fit. Um, just binoculars on that, and it's, it's like it's fantastic. It looks like somebody's just emptied diamond dust over the black velvet in the sky. And this is an open cluster. This, the, all these hot blue stars here, they're young, relatively young hot blue stars. They're moving through space. They've encountered some dust, and we're getting reflection nebulosity around them where their light is being scattered by the dust. So that is, that, that is an, an open cluster. And if we go back to the image almost started off with talking about these, and we look again, Orion's belt, the Orion Nebula. This is the Orion Nebula as it is now. A few million years ago, this bit here would have looked like that. But now we have a cluster of stars. Even f there's still a bit of nebulosity associated with that little fuzzy bit of fuzziness. This one here, NGC 1981, now is just it's just a little cluster now. So we're almost looking at how things evolve in this part of the sky, from the emission nebula where stars are being born to eventually all that gas and dust is effectively used up and dispersed, and we're left with an open cluster which will itself will gradually disperse. The one that nobody looks at is this huge one here, it's called Colander 70. Absolutely stunning. This is another big, big open cluster. Uh, very, it's really spreading out a lot now, which is why it's covering so much of the sky. But so we're getting that. We can also learn a lot by looking at the distribution of these things in the sky. So if we look at what all this looked like in the summer, uh, because this is the easiest time to see it, the orange on here is open clusters. Because these are regions of star formation, they are going to be associated with the Milky Way. They, so this is where the Milky Way runs through the sky as well, um, which is why they're sometimes called galactic clusters. They're part of a galactic plane. When we look to either side of it, we see the red things, which are the galaxies. It's difficult to see them through, through the stars of the Milky Way. But when we look out of the Milky Way, uh, we can see that. And then the black things here, which are the globular clusters, See, we've got a lot of them down here in the southern Milky Way, but we don't see any bright ones here in the northern Milky Way. And what this can teach us quite simply is how our, our galaxy is formed and our place in it. So we've got the galaxy here, the spiral arms, this bit here. When we look out of it, up and down on this bit here, this is when we're seeing other galaxies because we're not trying to look at them through it. And yet when we look towards the south in ours, this is where we've got the globular clusters. And yes, that's the direction in which the globular clusters are. So we're looking towards the galactic bulge. Um, the Milky Way gets much denser in the middle, so this was a pretty obvious anyway. The way stars move in there, if you look at Andrea Gez's work or something like that, you start to you start to see this. So really, with looking at just looking at fuzzy blobs in the sky these nebulae and, uh, and clusters, and a lot of clusters do look like nebulae, um, we can actually start to learn a lot about, or they teach us a lot about star formation, the whole stellar cycle, life cycle, and also the structure of our galaxy, and also a little bit about the universe. Right, I hope you feel as though that has been worth listening to. So if you have been, thank you for listening. Um, it's one of my favorite recent images. This is one I took in the summer, and this is called the North American Nebula. You can either imagine that this is Mexico, and that is um, the Gulf of Mexico, and that's Florida, or you can imagine it the other way up, and that's Hudson's Bay and the rest of the ones down there. Anyway, that's, that's up to you. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to try and take any questions if there are any. Um, 
yeah, again, uh, encourage everyone to put any questions. That brings us to the end of the formal meeting. Many thanks to Steve for a fascinating and enlightening talk and to you all for attending. I wish you the safest and best Christmas you can manage under the circumstances and we look forward to seeing you all in January. <laughs>